winner of the New Jersey Press Association's Most Innovative Award. Welcome back to Greater Media Broadcast News. I'm Susie Shea bringing you the top headlines in Central New Jersey. Here's what you need to know. Gadgets in class, child car safety, man accused of double murder, on the road, and farmer's market opens in Seabright. As the school year approaches, many districts will seek to modernize an aging educational system and improve the learning process. How? By allowing students to use their personal tech gadgets in class. School districts from Jackson to Woodbridge are beginning to employ bring your own device programs, which in most cases have students using their personal iPads for research and classroom projects. One local district has allowed teachers to incorporate the devices into lesson plans in a number of ways, from streaming digital video content to creating children's books online. But some critics are concerned about the potential for abuse and cyberbullying that could crop up. For more on the educational trend and its potential costs and pitfalls, see your Greater Media newspaper today. And summer may be ending, but that doesn't mean there aren't safety concerns when it comes to leaving a child in a vehicle. Taylor Lear has more on how local child safety advocates are making a difference. It happens way too frequently that we hear about a child being left in a scorching hot car for hours during the hot summer months. This has resulted in 44 children dying of heat stroke last year. However, with the help of campaigns like Safe Kids New Jersey, awareness is being brought to the issue. On August 14th, a demonstration was held by Safe Kids at the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital most Mobile Health Services building in New Brunswick. The demonstration showed the realities of what happens when a child is left in a hot car. During the demonstration, the temperature in the car rose nearly 20 degrees in only 12 minutes, showing how dangerous it can truly be. Due to Safe Kids' efforts, it has been three years since a child in New Jersey has died in a car from heat stroke. As part of the campaign, a sign warning parents about the dangers of this issue will be placed in North Brunswick later this month. The signs will eventually be moved to Piscataway, Sayreville, and other locations throughout Middlesex County. For more information about the campaign, visit www.safekidsnewjersey.com. And here's a roundup of headlines you need to know. A former Old Bridge mayor and Middlesex County freeholder will forever be remembered as the namesake of the James T. Phillips Boardwalk at Old Bridge Waterfront Park. The boardwalk was restored and reopened this year after being destroyed by Superstorm Sandy. Phillips died in February at age 60. This year's New Jersey's Bike MS Ambassador is a South Amboy resident. Jessica Bills watched both her parents struggle with multiple sclerosis in recent years, but she tackled it one bike ride at a time. A Long Branch resident could face life in prison if convicted of murdering his cousin and her 10-year-old foster daughter. Brian Farmer allegedly killed the two after his cousin found him photographing the child while forcing her to perform sexual acts on August 1st. The future of development in Manalapan may focus on the Route 33 corridor. The largely undeveloped state highway is getting a renewed look and officials say several development proposals have been submitted and will be reviewed. And here's Amy Rosen with What's Going On Around Town. Transformations are quite common at the Barron Arts Center in Woodbridge, as special events are presented throughout the year. An upcoming art exhibit will reflect that concept when Transformations, the art of Anthony Santella, opens in the Barron's Gallery on September 6th. Santella, a resident of Teaneck, sees transformation as an unavoidable, often unwelcome part of existence as people age, relationships change, and people pass on into legend. He uses his paintings and sculpture to express himself, per portray his fascination with myths, legends, and visions, and understand life and death. Some of the artist's wooden sculptures come from trees that were deeply rooted in his personal life. One tree felled in Superstorm Sandy was his childhood friend, and another, a 253-year-old tree that was cut down despite public outcry, was the basis for a mourning process in which Santella photographed the stump for a year. His efforts to preserve and pay homage to both trees is evident throughout this exhibit. The Transformations exhibit will be at the Barron Art Center through September 25th. Read this week's Woodbridge Sentinel for more details. Back to you, Susie. And here's Mike Pavlishko of Greater Media's WCTC with an update on Rutgers football. After that, we go to Tim Morris with more on local sports.
Hi everybody, I'm standing right across from the Rutgers football practice facilities where the Scarlet Knights are wrapping up preseason camp and getting set for the season opener coming up on Thursday the 28th at Washington State in Seattle. So time for our 2014 predictions, as promised. Well, I think the Scarlet Knights win the opener on the road. Last year, they hung in with Fresno State, a pass-happy team. Washington State, much like that. And I'll tell you what, I think Gary Nova, who has started season strong, will do it again for the Scarlet Knights, and they win that opening game. They come back home against FCS opponent Howard and get a win. Then on September 13th, first Big Ten game in school history, I think they stun Penn State here at home to go 3-0. and Then two more conference games. You've got Navy on the road in Annapolis, a little bit of a tough game. You've got Tulane here at home. I think the Scarlet Knights win both. They're 5-0 and and on a roll, but heading into really tough part of the Big Ten schedule. you got a home game against Michigan on a Saturday night. Then you have road games at Ohio State and Nebraska, a home game against the Wisconsin Badgers coming in. That's a tough stretch for the Scarlet Knights. I think their best bet after 5-0 and for wins are Indiana on Senior Day here at home and at Maryland in the regular season finale. I think they win one of those two games, and I think they end up 6-6 six and six this season. Now, you may say 6-6, six and six, that's all. Look, this is not the Big East anymore. It's not the American Athletic Conference. This is a very tough league, and Rutgers has the toughest schedule of any Big Ten team. 6-6, six and six, you're going to a pretty good bowl game as a member of the Big Ten, and that works for me in year one. I'm Mike Pavlichko on 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com. Horse racing wasn't the only competition at Monmouth Park last weekend. The racetrack's Bluegrass Mini Golf Course hosted a U.S. Miniature Golf Tour tournament on August 15th and 16th. Many of the top miniature golfers on the tour, including past master champions, took on the challenge of a horse-themed course. A purse of $12,000 was at stake, as well as a berth in the U.S. Mini Golf Masters later in the year. It wasn't Amen Corner, but the Bluegrass Mini Golf Course provided plenty of obstacles of their own for the golfers to negotiate. Many were left with testy par putts. That, when they were made, provided relief. This woman made par look casual. This was a near miss to the golfer's main goal, a hole in one. On this tricky downhill hole, John Miller did sink this putt for the coveted hole-in-one. What is it about miniature golf itself? <laughs> it's, it's just fun, you know, it's, we can get competitive in it and we have a good time doing it. And uh, what are some of the keys to, you know, courses like this, uh, negotiating them? The ones here you gotta really read the breaks and you gotta know how the bricks bounce, I guess, I don't know. Is that something you can pick up like warming up or do you have to play? You have to play the course a few times to understand it. Oh, okay. That was Middletown's Jay Curdy talking about miniature golf. As a horse-themed course, each hole was named for a legendary racehorse, including, of course, Secretariat. Tim Morris for Greater Media Newspapers. You might have seen the Eagles or Bon Jovi on tour, but how much do you know about the roadies who accompany them? Well, a new documentary may shed some light. Here's Kathy Chang. After more than two decades behind the scenes in the music industry, Timothy T.J. Hoffman is documenting his experience in a new film titled Roadie. The Kendall Park resident's career began in 1992 when the 23-year-old took an internship with a recording studio in South River. He said he started out helping local bands with moving gear, equipment, and cabinets. Then a band called MOD, or Method of Destruction, asked him if he would like to work as part of its crew on an upcoming European tour. That kicked off a whirlwind career as a production music technician and tour manager for several bands. His biggest tour was with New Jersey-based rock band Skid Row, which was opening for KISS on its farewell tour in 1999. 
Hoffman is now working on a documentary, Roadie, in which he highlights life on the road and behind the scenes, a place where glamour butts heads with working class grit. Thus far, he has funded the project out of his own pocket with the goal of raising $25,000 to finish the project. Hoffman is seeking help through crowdfunding. For more information, visit www.rodyfilm.com or visit our website at www.gmnews.com. A newly formed farmer's market is breathing life back into the community of Seabright. Here's Greg Kennelty. Vendors and organizers of the Seabright Farmer's Market celebrated the grand opening of the market last Thursday. Former disaster recovery workers and organic food enthusiasts Christine Giaimo, Liz Murno, and Pamela Caputo organized the market. The market's grand opening took place on Thursday, August 14th from 2 to 7 p.m. in the municipal parking lot located on Ocean Avenue and will be held every Thursday up until October 30th. The market features vendors who sell products they grow or make themselves, including organic and naturally grown fruits and vegetables, organic locally grown coffee, fresh baked breads and pastries, raw honey, and locally crafted vegan soaps. Among the items available at the market will be Jersey tomatoes, sweet corn, summer squash, eggplants, peppers, onions, potatoes, beets, melons, peaches, and plums. Alongside special vendors, the organizers will invite on a week-to-week -week basis. For this story and more, see your local Greater Media newspaper. For more in-depth coverage and additional stories, see your Greater Media newspaper today. Keep up with the latest headlines by liking us at facebook.com slash greatermediabroadcastnews. I'm Susie Shea. Thanks for tuning in.